I am going to get rocking and rolling in just a minute here because I think we should be good to go. Looks like we've got 10 folks in the room right now. I imagine we may have some others join as we're going along, but that's okay with the digital nature of this. Uh, I think we'll be just fine. So to give you all a bit of an intro, my name is James Murphy. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resource Agent for UGA Extension Rockdale County. Um, obviously, it seems like y'all are coming in from all over the place. So I may not be your local county extension agent, but regardless, I'm very grateful for y'all joining me. Uh, I'm glad that y'all made it in today and Hopefully we'll be able to give you some excellent information on how to take care of your lawn as that is certainly a hot topic right now as we get into the warmer months. Uh, so as the slide says, this is Lawn Care 101 uh, and let's begin. So to begin, the, the idea of the perfect lawn is something that is maybe a bit of a platonic ideal, you know, something that people strive for that they want to achieve uh, and the idea of the perfect lawn is one that has no weeds, no insect issues, no disease problems, no need to purchase any fertilizer. You don't have to water it, or at least you don't have to pay attention to the watering. Uh, you don't have to mow it. It's going to grow in the shade, and it is going to be that beautiful emerald green 365 days a year. So you want the perfect lawn, and you're hoping, I guess, that today I'm going to tell you how to achieve the perfect lawn. Well, we're gonna start off with a little bit of a curveball because the perfect lawn doesn't exist outside of AstroTurf, outside of, outside of fake lawns. That's not necessarily a bad thing though. You know, I think uh, AstroTurf once upon a time got a very bad rap um, because it is, you know, can be seen as such an artificial thing or looking sort of cheap and chintzy. Um, but you'd be surprised. Um, um, myself and my wife, we were out at a festival uh, at a neighborhood near our apartment in Decatur, uh, and I was looking at this beautiful green lawn, uh, and, you know, I was like, wow, you know, that looks perfectly manicured, and as I got closer, sure enough, uh, it was a fake lawn. Um, now, this may not be what you would want, you know, maybe you certainly want a real planted lawn, uh, but understand that this is an option. You know, if you want to tick all those boxes that we saw on that previous slide, you want no muss, no fuss, and you just want it to look great, um, this may be an option. But for everything else, we're going to dig into it as far as how to do your best to, to strive for that perfect lawn using an actual planted lawn. Before we get into too much depth, uh, I want to kind of present the turf grass mantra as it is. Uh, which is to say that healthy, thick turf grass is going to be more resistant, and I want to stress more resistant, not immune, to insects, diseases, and environmental stressors. Uh, overall, a lot of the concepts that I'm going to be covering in this talk are going to feed back into this concept that if you maintain a healthy, thick stand of turf, if you keep your turf happy, you're gonna to have to deal with a lot less issues. You're gonna to have to deal with a lot less of playing catch up uh, or, or having to engage in rescue operations, let's say, uh, to try and deal with things if you are investing on the front end to keep things happy and healthy. So what are the top five lawn problems? Um, sort of in rough order, you'll see that the very top sort of percentage wise is people, as in sort of mismanagement, or maybe, you know, folks coming in and utilizing a space in a way that wasn't meant to be utilized, or what we term as abiotic disorders. So abiotic meaning caused by things that are not living. So these can be uh, elements of the environment. Um, beyond that, and these are the things that I usually get calls about, are fungal diseases, weeds, insects, and nematodes. And you'll see that the percentage case of these is a lot lower. Um, and you'll see too at the bottom that these numbers were kind of pulled out of thin air. Don't expect these to be scientifically backed, but based on experience, this is generally what we see when we get calls, is a lot of these are gonna be caused uh, by these abiotic issues and then feed into something else. So what is an abiotic issue? Uh, here's a big old list. 
that kind of illustrates what we talk about. So pesticides are, are way up there, and I get a lot of calls about this, especially, you know, maybe you have a bit of a neighbor dispute or somebody's worried that a lawn care service has caused issues. Um, this certainly is a problem, but we have to definitely handle it on a case-by-case -case basis because, you know, there can be liability involved in this, and so we want to be very careful and sort of assigning blame. Beyond that, things like animal urine, so the old doggone it problem, um, I've seen this before, you know, spots on a lawn and, you know, the, the couple living there just couldn't figure it out, and then their two cute little teacup Yorkies come running out to the yard, and they show me, oh, well, that's where they go all the time, and sure enough, you know, the salts and uh, ammonia content can certainly do a lot to that turf. Uh, excess fertilizer, and on the flip side, a low fertilizer as well as pH issues can certainly cause problems with turf thriving. Chemical spills, uh, soaps, fuel cleaners, you know, if you're, you're washing your car, you work on your car in your driveway and you've got issues on those margins. Uh, physical issues with the, the soil, like compaction, uh, thatch, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later, but it, later, but it's sort of a layer of dead grass that is sort of fallen over and, and made a spongy layer underneath the actual blade canopy. Temperature is another big one. Uh, we'll cover different types of turf and what they like in a little bit, but temperature is a huge one. Shade is absolutely massive, uh, and it can be changed, but a lot of people are reluctant to change it, especially if they've got a nice tree. Uh, it often becomes a battle between uh, whether the client prefers their beautiful tree or they want to have a nice lawn. But you have to understand that the turf needs that sun just as much, if not more, than that tree does. Uh, scalping and mower injury, this can be caused by dull blades, which we'll talk about too a little bit later. Uh, abrasive injury, so using a space, again, for something it wasn't necessarily meant for. Uh, it's nice to have a lawn that you can go outside and you can spend time on, but if it's a high traffic area, um, you know, this is seen more commonly, I think, in maybe industrial plantings or in public areas uh, where people are kind of walking where you don't necessarily intend them, and then you can get issues with compaction and injury. Septic tanks and drain fields, these can cause nutrient issues, issues with overfertility, and also issues with drainage, uh, and then water stress, which is absolutely massive and we'll cover uh, in depth, but either too little water, too much water, or having soil that just doesn't allow that water to drain. So your biggest enemies, we've got some of these abiotic issues that we talked about, you know, that again, that's sort of 70% of things, these bare spots that can be caused by numerous things, too much water, improper fertilization, either too much or too little, uh, soil compaction or shade, then feed into some of those things that we see uh, in a little bit more minor sense in terms of where when they actually show up, but these are the things often that we'll get calls about, that people call about weeds, or they call about insects, or they call about diseases. These biotic issues can be these, you know, indicators, but really they weren't the problem initially. They were probably caused or potentiated by some of these other things, by, by again, that stand of turf lacking the ability to thrive and grow strong and resist some of these issues. So I'm gonna do this really in a nutshell uh, because it is a big topic and it's worthy of a lot of discussion, um, but we're gonna just briefly touch on weed control because we've only got about an hour, uh, but don't fret. One of the publications I'm gonna leave y'all with is gonna cover uh, weed control in depth. So there's gonna be more than we have here, but just understand from a proper lawn care perspective, you're going to want to have a consistent program of pre-emergent and post-emergent application. And this is strictly for chemical control. So pre-emergent is going to be applied before seed germination or really before uh, weeds break the ground and actually begin growing to where they have visible foliage. Um, so this is generally gonna be done in these transition periods. So this is gonna be done for our, our summer weeds probably uh, in late winter, early spring, kind of in that realm or our fall winter weeds, uh, late summer, uh, early fall. Uh, and this is basically, again, gonna be done to try and prevent things from, from getting started. Uh, Pre-emergents are good because you're generally gonna have a reduced chance of off-target effects, especially on ornamentals. Lawns are obviously usually planted near ornamentals, and so this is good because you don't have to worry so much about it, at least for most of the pre-emergents we use. 
Uh, one key thing though, is you only want to do this for established lawns. So lawns that have been around for at least a year. Uh, beyond that, you can really stress the turf because some of these chemistries are going to obviously have impacts on, on these, this very young turf or turf that's just trying to get established. Another note is that you need to water this in for effectiveness because again, we're dealing with a subterranean issue. Uh, we're dealing with seeds, rhizomes, things like that. So if you don't get that chemistry delivered down through the soil column, it's not going to be effective. The other side of chemical weed management is post-emergent. So as the name suggests, these would be applied after weed emergence when you're actually seeing that leaf material emerge from the soil. Uh, Post-emergence can control both grasses and broadleafs. Typically in a turf context, uh, broadleaf weeds are gonna be a little easier to control just because of what we call selectivity, uh, just because certain chemicals are gonna affect certain types of plants. Uh, but that's not to say that we don't have post-emergent that can affect uh, grassy and sedge uh, type plants. Post-emergence can be great for spot treatment. So again, if you're proactive and you're on top of maintaining your stand of turf, uh, they're great for man managing some of that. The only thing environmentally to be concerned about is that they can be washed away or potentially evaporate if you're not mindful of your environmental conditions. So if you're not mindful of your own irrigation or rainfall or the temperature, um, but a lot of that will be stated on any labeling or recommendation. So real quick on some other methods for weed control, mowing of course, especially for some of our perennial weeds, by depleting that underground resource by frequent mowing, you can help keep some of that down. Hand pulling is great. It's always best to get on top of a kind of new invasion as quickly as possible. If you see something pop up uh, and you haven't seen it before, go ahead and pull it up. You know, don't give it time to really gain purchase and get established. Uh, and again, to underscore that mantra, keep your turf happy and healthy, well watered, well fertilized, well mowed, and you won't have to worry about it as much. Now delving into actual turf types. So here in the Piedmont, again, I work in Rockdale County, so I see somewhat of a mix that we do bias towards warm season grasses. Uh, but when making management decisions, you need to know your turf. So if you're not sure what kind of turf you have, uh, I would reach out to your county agent and see if you can get a turf ID or see if you, you can get that figured out because that's gonna help a lot with management. Uh, but basically, broadly speaking, we have cool season and warm season grasses. Our cool season grasses are gonna grow best during the cool months of the year, as the name suggests. So around 60 to 75 degrees average temperature, uh, but they don't really like getting too much hotter than that. So again, down in Rockdale, I'll see some fescue. Uh, it's more common, I think, in pastures for our horses that we have down there than we have in terms of fescue lawns. Uh, but you will see some bluegrass, and we'll touch on ryegrass even in warm season turf a little bit later. Our warm season grasses, again, I see these more commonly. Uh, Bermuda is perhaps the most common one I see, but I do see a fair amount of zoysia, some centipede, uh, and just recently, actually during quarantine, I did a no contact site visit for a woman who has St. Augustine in Old Town Conyers. So that was the first one I'd actually seen up in our neck of the woods, but you do see it a lot more commonly as you get south in the state uh, towards the coastal plain. So why do people select certain types of turf? Well, it's because different types have certain types of desirable characteristics. Um, so one of the ones is, of course, cold tolerance. Obviously, cool season grasses are going to uh, prefer or do better in cool weather, but warm season varieties can also uh, be valued for their tolerance of cold weather. So you'll see here up at the top, in terms of high tolerance for our warm season, our zoysia is great. Zoysia is perhaps my favorite turf grass, and I'm not even really a, a big turf guy, uh, but it is great. It is also pretty expensive. Um, Bermuda, also pretty tolerant of cold, but if you have a Bermuda lawn, you're also probably familiar that it will go dormant, it'll go brown. And then we go down to Bahia, Centipede, Carpet, and you'll see St. Augustine way down there, can't really tolerate cold too much. Um, for our cool season, bent grass uh, and Kentucky bluegrass are up there in terms of real cool season, but then we've got fescue and then down to rye, a little bit lower. On the flip side, our heat tolerance, again, zoysia up there on the top, followed by Bermuda for our warm season varieties. In cool season, you can see that uh, fescue is actually up there pretty high. So you can see why this is, extends down here around in the Piedmont region, because it can tolerate a bit of cool and a bit of warm. 
So it's, it can be a good variety, especially in our pastures where it's a desirable uh, feed grass or forage grass. Drought tolerance, this is another big one. Uh, definitely got some calls about this and continue to get calls as we're having issues with spring green up of some of our lawns. Uh, you can see that Bermuda is up there on top. I think this is the only thing that it really beats out zoysia on and it probably depends on actual variety. Uh, but definitely something to consider because as we'll talk about with irrigation as a principal uh, practice, uh, drought tolerance can be important. And that's not to say that they are uh, completely immune from the effects of drought, but that just that they'll tolerate those drier conditions. And again, over in our cool season grasses, you'll see that fescue is up there on top, uh, again, demonstrating why it's, it's desirable. And shade. Uh, shade is another huge one. So I think an interesting thing to point out here is that you'll see St. Augustine actually beats zoysia in terms of shade tolerance. But look all the way down there at the bottom in terms of warm season turf type shade tolerance. And you'll see that Bermuda just doesn't tolerate it. And again, for a very commonly planted grass, uh, this often becomes a bit of a tug of war for homeowners deciding whether they're going to keep their nice tree or plant a nice tree uh, or maintain a nice stand of turf uh, if you've got a Bermuda lawn. You've got zoysia or you've got something else, you know, if you've got fine fescue, you may be able to have the best of both worlds, but it's not necessarily always the case. And I, I do want to underscore here for all of these when we're talking tolerance, just because it's at the top of one of these charts does not mean that it's perfect, that it's immune, just that it's going to be tolerant. So irrigation. Uh, irrigation is a big subject. Uh, and it can be affected through a number of different ways, um, but I just want to talk about some of the things that influence it. So the first and perhaps most obvious one is soil type. Uh, in our region, we have very clay heavy soils, uh, which means small particle size and able to be compacted fairly easily, especially if there's no root material breaking that up. Um, they can have a decent amount of nutrients, but often those get locked up due to the nature of the clay particles. Um, type of grass, as we've just discussed, will determine the amount of water actually needed. The fertilizer program, when you're fertilizing, will determine how much that turf actually needs uh, and whether the turf is in dormancy or whether it is actively growing. Rain frequency, obviously, uh, if Mother Nature is watering the turf for you, then you are going to need less. But if she's being a little uh, tight with providing the water for you, then uh, of course you're going to have to make up that uh, shortfall, otherwise you're going to see stress. And then some other environmental conditions that kind of go with that temperature, wind, humidity, obviously those all kind of uh, inform the same choices. So on the subject of irrigation, uh, if you are going to take anything away from this, I think you should take away that irrigation is the most important thing you can focus on for a happy and healthy lawn. Um, and that is to say you should at least have a plan for it. You don't have to irrigate perfectly all the time, but you should at least be considering it. Um, so when should you irrigate? Uh, you really only want to do it when the grass shows stress symptoms. That means for most of our varieties, it's going to start to turn sort of dull, uh, more bluish green than vibrant kind of emerald green. Uh, you'll also see some physical changes. The leaf blade will often start to roll or fold a little bit. And footprints are another big indicator. If you can walk across your lawn uh, and leave footprints that last for a minute or longer, it's time to water. Uh, as far as how much to water, ideally you want to water uh, enough to soak down into your soil for to the depth of around six to eight inches, because that's the root zone that you want to promote. Uh, and you need to be applying that, about one inch of that water, to a depth of six to eight inches every seven to ten days. And of course that's going to vary with rainfall and some of the other characteristics that we just mentioned. So why do we recommend uh, that amount of water and that depth and that frequency? It's because this is exactly what we're trying to promote. Uh, we're trying to promote root development ultimately because even though what we're uh, perhaps seeing is the above ground biomass of our turf. What we really need for it to be happy and healthy is the below ground biomass, which is our rhizomes and our roots. And so by having shorter frequent irrigation, so if you're on a schedule, here I'll pull up my laser pointer. If you're on a schedule of you know three, four, five times a week of very short irrigations, this is what you end up with, is a very poorly developed root system. 
However, if you do that more infrequently, once or twice every seven to 10 days, depending on rainfall, and delivering that deep into the soil column, you get much better root development. So what that means is these roots are gonna be much more drought tolerant, and they're also gonna hold on to that soil a lot better. So even if you get stress above ground, you're gonna have less potential issues with compaction and with soil loss down the road. This is a little chart just to illustrate just how much water you really need to distribute, because I think a lot of people kind of get uh, sticker shock a little bit when they start to do irrigation, when they, when they try to get an idea of you know, what they really need to engage in. So just understand, if you want to deliver uh, that one inch of water to that six to eight inch depth, we're talking here in kind of our semi-clay loam uh, area, uh, you're really going to be having to put a fair amount of water out there. And the average sprinkler is going to be putting out roughly a quarter inch of water per hour. So if you do the math on that, if you need to be delivering somewhere in the realm of 1.5 inches, you know, that could be, you know, four to six hours of continuous irrigation, depending on the actual rate of your sprinkler. Um, now, obviously, this isn't ideal for most folks, um, but you need to have that consideration, especially during drought conditions. Is this something you can do? Uh, or, you know, do you need to think of other turf management strategies? Uh, because again, flipping to just a very short irrigation schedule, as we showed here, uh, is only going to do harm to the turf in the long run. So when do you water? I get a lot of questions about this too. Uh, the time of day to water should basically be any time from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Um, you really want to do it at night. Uh, I generally recommend early morning as much as possible, uh, and that's for a few reasons. But most importantly, wet grass is gonna be a disease opportunity. Wet grass uh, is kind of an unnatural state of being, or especially wet grass in a otherwise kind of sunny or humid environment can promote diseases, especially some of our bacterial or fungal diseases. Um, beyond that also, if you've got your sprinkler running in the middle of the August sun and those droplets are staying on those leaf blades, uh, then that sun can actually be magnified. There are, those droplets will act like tiny little magnifying glasses and you can get leaf burn that way. So yeah, basically you just don't want to extend that dew point. You want that grass to dry out uh, because that is a much more natural state of being. You can deliver that water uh, around that kind of dew point and then allow it to naturally evaporate. Uh, irrigation efficiency is another big one because I think uh, a lot of folks, again, get sticker shock because they're not watering properly. They don't know how to water. And so maybe you're just watering way too much or you've got a system that hasn't been properly calibrated or had a look at uh, in quite some time. Maybe you got it installed a while ago and you just kind of take it for granted that it's doing what it's supposed to. So during a drought or dormancy is a great time to check on it. I mean, you can check on it at any time of year, but it's great to really check on it when you've either got the time or you really need to make sure you're delivering it properly. Uh, so, you know, run these, if you've got, you know, a clock or, you know, a central system, you know, run your various zones and just take a walk around and make sure that the water is being applied uniformly, that you've got no issues with your emitters. Um, rain sensors are also great uh, this way, especially if they're integrated with your various zones. Um, they've gotten quite sophisticated now where they can actually turn off and turn back on programs depending on how much rain is delivered. Uh, and another thing is you want to make sure you're not watering your sidewalks. I see this plenty of the time, uh, especially going around subdivisions or, you know, public or commercial areas. Uh, you'll see, you know, an emitter just blasting out water all over a sidewalk and that's just money wasted and obviously it's not helping the turf. So another practice that's important to engage in is managing your fertility. Um, this is certain, certainly another thing that I get plenty of questions about. So to manage your fertility properly, you'll need to run a soil test. Obviously right now things are a little odd for us in terms of soil testing. Uh, if you've never run a soil test before, uh, this is what the report you'll get looks like. Um, I guess before getting too far into that, I will say if you do need to get a soil test now, there is a website for it. That's uh, soiltest123.com. Uh, from there, you can navigate to the Georgia specific page and then you can order a kit, uh, including return postage and submission form uh, as you need to. 
But yeah, after you run that soil test, this is what you'll get back. So you'll see this is for a zoysia lawn. Uh, you'll see you'll get all of your nutrients, your, your ma macronutrients, as well as some of your micronutrients and pH. And then basically what we'll return is a recommendation. So you not only get your uh, levels reported here, but then you'll get recommendations for that limestone, because again, we have pretty acidic soils uh, here in the Piedmont region, and then some recommendations both for establishment and for maintenance. That's gonna give you an idea of just how much and uh, what concentrations you need to broadcast. So to delve a little bit further into what those recommendations mean, if you've never applied fertilizer, you'll see that they oftentimes, uh, if not always, will have some type of numbers listed on the bag. And these basically are the, refer to the percent by weight of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus inside that bag. So an example for a 1648 bag, which is, a, this is a very conventional lawn fertilizer that we'll see, a 16% nitrogen, so eight pounds, 4% phosphorus, two pounds, and 8% potassium, four pounds. Um, and so that's exactly what this means. And again, that'll be determined by what we measure for your lawn. You'll also see where those nutrient sources are gonna come from. Uh, one of the other questions that I get is organic versus non-organic fertilizers. And strictly speaking, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, I would try and adhere to the soil test as much as possible rather than trying to make sure that you're strict, strictly adhering to an organic practice because at the end of the day, the plants don't know the difference between organic and inorganic nutrients. Um, so I would use, you know, what's available. If you've got access to good organic material, you know, you've got your own manure or your own compost, have at it. Uh, it just may not be as precise in terms of nutrients. A note on application, you'll see this weird kind of zigzag diagram that I've got over here. Uh, this basically indicates how you should apply, whether you're using a, a hand spreader or drop spreader for a granular format, or a granular format of fertilizer, I should say. And the idea here is just basically for a given unit area, uh, chances are your lawn isn't perfectly square or rectangular, you wanna try and get good coverage. So try as much as possible as you can to sort of checkerboard or zigzag across like that to get full coverage. Now another uh, big question that I get a lot is mowing. Um, so mowing can be you know, a, a touchy subject um, and it can be a difficult one to try and really dial in because there are a lot of factors that can influence it, uh, but we'll try and touch on them as much as we can. So first and foremost, let's talk just mower types. I think the most conventional one, the, the one that most folks, at least nowadays, are familiar with are rotary mowers, either of the, the push variety or the, the sit on top, right on top variety. Uh, rotary mowers are great because they are readily commercially available. They're usually pretty cheap. Uh, they come in a number of different formats. You can get them in gas and electric. Uh, however, as with any tool, they're really only as good as the person that is maintaining and using them. Uh, and so for our rotary mowers, I really would recommend blade maintenance being perhaps the most key thing outside of, you know, doing regular kind of engine maintenance and just checking on things like that. Keeping your blade sharp uh, is going to really do a lot for you uh, because ideally you want to get a very clean cut. Uh, dull blades are going to sort of tear or bludgeon the grass rather than actually slicing it. And what that does is really allow a lot of opportunity for water to leave the grass and for diseases to make their way in because you end up having a higher surface area cut than you would otherwise. Um, also, rotary mowers are really only good for around down to two inches of mowing height. So that's good for most people. But if you need something uh, that's a little more delicate, a little more manicured or presented down to a much lower height, you're probably going to need something like over here on the right, which is our real mower. And so these use an actual sort of scissor mechanism uh, to then trap those blades of grass and give a very clean cut. Uh, and for areas, if you're trying to keep things very low, uh, say down to around a half inch, uh, you're probably going to want to use a real mower so you don't end up scalping or damaging an area. So this is much more a finesse mechanism, uh, rather this would be used for you know, larger areas. 
Some general mowing tips, uh, regardless of what you're using. Um, the big one that I want to point out is to only remove around a third, or a third of the total blade volume at any given time, or the blade length, I should say. Um, this is to avoid stressing the grass. So even if you want to keep your grass a little bit shorter, it's better to cut it in increments down to that lower height rather than try and remove a ton of it at once because that can really remove a lot of it. Uh, don't mow the grass when it's wet, like immediately after it's rained or an irrigation because that wet soil is much easier to compact, which can cause issues with our, our uh, root development and therefore our stand of turf thriving. Uh, as I mentioned too, we want to keep our mower blades nice and sharp and you want to change those mowing patterns uh, as you're going through the season. Uh, basically, again, that, that figure I showed for fertilizer application, as you're going across that lawn, that's obviously can cause some issues with compaction. Um, so the same deal can happen with, with mowing. So you want to make sure that you're avoiding uh, treading the same ground over and over and over again. Another tip on mowing um, in shadier areas, uh, you may want to consider raising that mower height to give the ability for that grass to grow a little bit higher and to, to produce some more energy uh, because otherwise it can start to thin out if you just mow it uniformly. So thatch is another issue that we deal with. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, as you can see here, we have a bit of an illustration showing what thatch looks like and it's just a layer of kind of dead or decomposing grass. Um, generally, it's not that bad as long as you don't let it exceed a level of about a half inch. Uh, anything above about a level of a half inch, you can start having problems with either insects that like to hide out in that thatch and then feed on our kind of crown level, uh, or you can promote fungal issues because this is a very dark and humid area that can allow fungal spores to propagate. Uh, if you have issues with thatch, if your turf is feeling kind of spongy, uh, it doesn't feel like it should, you might consider renting or contracting somebody to uh, use something like this. This is a power rake. It's also called a verticutter. Uh, it has vertical blades, unlike our horizontal blades on a mower, and it'll actually chop up and rake out that thatch uh, to help open up that canopy a little bit. Another cultural practice that we uh, encourage people to do, uh, and I will say this kind of goes hand in hand with our dethatching in terms of frequency. So maybe, you know, once a year max, probably somewhere in the realm of once every two, three years. Uh, but this is core aeration. So the idea here is that basically you're going to take a uh, device like this that has a roller with tines on it, either spikes or hollow tines are preferred. And as it rolls across the turf, it's actually going to pull out these little plugs or if it's a spine or spike aerator, it's just going to push little holes in there. Uh, and what this does is help combat compaction from walking or general use and allow more room for those roots to spread out, but also allow that water again to penetrate deeper in that soil column. So down to that six to eight inch preferred root depth. Um, so again, this doesn't have to be done every single year. Uh, and it really, you know, it can be done if you're just having problem areas and you, maybe you need to loosen up that turf a little bit or loosen up that soil a little bit. Um, but it is definitely an important practice. Top dressing is another thing uh, that we encounter as, as a potential practice. Uh, so top dressing is done uh, by taking compost or soil or other organic material uh, and basically placing it on top, uh, you know, as the name suggests. Uh, really the important thing here is that you have at least a quarter inch, uh, otherwise you're not really gonna have an effect uh, because by applying that amount, essentially you're kind of raising that, that so soil profile level. And so with this, the microbiota present in that top dress uh, can help to break down some of that thatch layer to kind of naturally decompose it, uh, but it can also help promote some additional root development, put out some additional roots and deal with issues of compaction underneath. Um, so just realize, you know, this can be a practice that you use, but you're generally only going to use that uh, if you can afford to put out at least a quarter inch. Another practice that we see in our warm season lawns is overseeding. Um, and so overseeding some, can sometimes mean just using the same turf variety to fill in patchier areas. So if you've got a Bermuda lawn going out and putting some Bermuda seed out there or similar, you know, for your crabgrass, zoysia, what have you. Uh, however, one of the 
more interesting practices we see here in our transition zone of the Piedmont is overseeding with winter rye. So this is taking an annual variety of ryegrass and once your warm season Bermuda, and we don't recommend this for zoysia, but once you're doing it for your Bermuda um, and it starts to enter uh, dormancy around September or October, you can actually take out and broadcast anywhere in the realm of five to 10 pounds per thousand square feet of annual rye. And so also before doing this, I would encourage you to go ahead and cut your, your Bermuda pretty short, uh, probably around an inch in height uh, before you broadcast that because it's gonna allow that, or that rye to get established a lot better. So then the benefits of this are twofold. One, uh, because rye is a cool season grass, you should then ideally have a green lawn uh, over the winter, over those cool months. Uh, you will still, of course, have to provide it with some water if it's not getting enough from mother nature, uh, as well as mow it, you know, keep it around that two to three inch height. Um, but then the other benefit is that it'll help to break up and condition that soil a little bit. It'll help you know, as those roots development, they'll break that up. It can actually sort of passively help mitigate issues with compaction. Um, one thing I would note is that this is really only for well-established lawns, uh, lawns that are already well-managed because otherwise you can have issues with the rye out-competing uh, your, your Bermuda or your poorly established lawn uh, because rye can be a bit of a, a weedy species if you're not careful. And as far as terminating the rye, you would kind of terminate it the inverse of the way that you did the Bermuda. So as things start to warm up, go ahead and cut it short uh, down to around the, you know, around the one inch height and then allow that Bermuda to green up. And as it warms up, because it's an annual and it doesn't tolerate warm temperatures, it'll naturally begin to die off. So this is a resource that I would uh, point y'all in the direction of whether you are trying to get a lawn established or whether you are uh, just trying to manage your lawn. Uh, these are a great kind of one-stop shop uh, in order for you to get an idea of what practices you need to engage in over the course of a typical year. So these are our lawn calendars. Uh, I've got the Bermuda grass lawn calendar up here just as an example, but we've got lawn calendars available for all of our major turf types. Uh, cool season and warm season. Um, but just to take a look at it, you'll see across the top, we've got the year laid out by month from January to December. And then over here on the left, we've got various practices to engage in along with recommendations. And these are going to be general recommendations um, and they can be modified depending on your particular situ situation. But then beyond that, you'll see that these recommendations then line up uh, as we go across in these rows. Uh, and where they intersect, you can see the actual probable uh, listed by a P or best uh, listed by a B or M marginal being, you might be able to get away with it um, to indicate when uh, or what time of year you should actually engage in these practices. So this is a great, just handy kind of like thing you can put up in your shed, uh, laminate it and have it there or you can download this, have it on your phone, have it on your computer to have an idea so you can effectively plan out for each month of the year what practices you should be looking at engaging in. So if you want more information, we do have plenty of it available. Um, I would check out the Georgia Turfgrass homepage at georgiaturf.com. Um, there's plenty available there. And as I said uh, at the beginning of the chat, uh, if you want information, I would highly recommend that you reach out to your local county agent, uh, or you can certainly email me after the fact. This is my contact information. Uh, our phone number right now, if you do try and reach out to us, will go to our secretary who will then have to forward it to me. Uh, so it may be easier and more direct to just email me uh, at that email address right there. Uh, but either way works. And then Hopefully soon, uh, we're looking at probably beginning of June, we will have some physical office open for turf diagnosis and soil testing and things of that nature. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end my screen share. Well, actually I'll share something else with y'all real quick. So let me see where I put those. So I'm about to put a couple publications 
in our chat. Let's see. And so this is something I wanted to show y'all. Uh, so this is going to be one of them. This is a, a great little handy guide, sort of summarizes a lot of the things that I went over today. Um, and so this is put together by Clint Waltz and Alfredo Martinez, a couple of the folks that we have down in Griffin. Uh, and this is really just going to cover a lot of those concepts in just sort of short form. So if you want kind of a bulleted list, uh, this will give you that information. Uh, additionally, I'm going to show y'all or share with y'all rather this PDF on weed control in home lawns. You can see that this one is 12 pages long uh, and it's going to cover quite a bit more. Um, so I didn't want to cover this too in depth in this lecture because uh, again, it gets complicated and, and in most if not all cases of weed control, uh, the recommendations need to be tailored to the client, which is why I didn't cover it quite as much here. So I'm gonna stop sharing so y'all should hopefully see me. And now what I'm gonna do in our chat box is I'm going to place a few links. So the first one is going to be a, lit, a link to a Qualtrics survey. Uh, if y'all could fill that out, it really helps us with uh, demographic information and just knowing who actually showed up. You'll also have the option to sign up for future webinars. Uh, we'll, we'll put you all on our listserv and then we can send them out as they come out. Uh, we'll probably, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, Ruth, yes, uh, this session is recorded. Uh, I haven't figured out exactly where it's going to be posted yet, but it is recorded. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, as I was saying, uh, demographic issue is, or our demographic uh, information rather, uh, is very valuable to us because we are federally and state funded, so we like to keep track of that stuff to make sure that we're reaching all the folks that we can. Uh, the other two links are going to be links to those publications that I just showed y'all in the screen share. So I'm gonna go ahead and post those in there. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we've certainly got a little bit of time, so if y'all have any questions, I am happy to answer them. And you can type those in chat. Hey James, can I can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, I don't have the ability to use chat on my phone, or at least I haven't figured it out. So I'm just going to ask here. Uh, yeah. Thanks for an informative session, first of all. Yeah, no uh, problem. I had a couple of questions, um, mainly one around the uh, the weed uh, the the weed control mechanism. So you did you know you mentioned you know the the ones that are pre-emergent and post-emergent. Mm -hmm. But I know there's a lot of controversy around using the Roundup or what some of these uh, these agents. So what are the organic options uh, or options that if we don't want to use these harsh chemicals that will decimate the bee population or that will, you know, that will have other issues there? Sure thing. So we do have organic recommendations. In fact, I can I can pull this up in our pest management handbook right now. Um, suffice to say, you do have to be careful with some of the organic recommendations because a lot of them will say, you know, use vinegar or use salt water and things like that, um, which those absolutely will take care of if you want to spot treat weeds um, rather than using something like a broad spectrum post-emergent like, you know, a glyphosate or 2,4-D or something like that, um, you can use uh, salt water, vinegar, things like that. But the issue with using those as compared to uh, some of these other chemistries is their residual time in the soil, especially something like salt water. Um, so that salt, uh, if, if it's used repeatedly, can build up in the soil because it's not going to evaporate. The water will get taken away and the salt will certainly be uh, phytotoxic to whatever weed that you're trying to eliminate. Um, but that salt can build up to the point where nothing is able to grow there. The salinity can get thrown off too much. Um, and the same thing with vinegar. You know, we touched on pH a little bit earlier. Uh, and again, it would take a fair number of uses. Uh, but it, it certainly is a, uh, a potential causative agent of issues uh, as far as throwing off the pH. So what I'm going to do... Um, I can find your email through the uh, the register. I think I should be able to, because um, I guess you can't access chat at all, right? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's. Uh, I I can't see it on my phone. Maybe there is a way. Let me let me look at it once. I might be able to do it. I'll I'll, I'll send an email following this. I think. Okay. Because yeah, I, I I've it's, got it pulled he, up for a uh, all of our organic recommendations from our pest management handbook, uh, and I'd be happy to send those along. It's got organic fungicide, pesticide, uh, and a bit of weed control as well. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Let's see. We've got, I think somebody else is speaking up, but we've got another one in chat. So new construction, new Bermuda lawn, not greening up and neighbors on both sides are lawn care co used weed killer in April prior to green up, uh, fixable now. So, I mean, as we've just kind of discussed, it's, it's complicated because we have a number of different factors there. So, um, it could be an issue with how the turf was initially established. Um, you know, was it seeded or sodded or plugged or any or sodded in? Um, so do you know if it was, did they come out and roll the turf and was it irrigated after rolling? Okay. So I, the fact that it's not greening up at this point is concerning, I'd say, because, um, I mean, we have had somewhat depressed temperatures, so I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, completely worry about it uh, or completely think that it's a lost cause um, because, you know, we're just now kind of coming out of uh, evening temperatures dipping down into the 40s. Uh, so you could have some issues uh, with uh, with just the cold or the environmental condition conditions, especially with new turf, not allowing it to green up. Um, the weed killer, though, depending on what they used, uh, you know, if they used atrazine or if they used some other type of pre-emergent, that could, you know, really be a problem. I, of course, I'd have to know what they sprayed. If you were able to get the records for them, which hopefully they've kept, uh, to get an idea of what they sprayed uh, and at what rate, that could definitely inform because um, if you look at you know, the, the weed control recommendations, a lot of our stuff, especially for pre-emergent, should not be used on newly sodded or newly established lawns. Thank you so much. And again, if, if you want my email, um, here, I'll just toss it in chat real quick. Uh, if, there's my email. If you want to send that to me once you get it from me, I'll be happy to do it. So let's see another question from Chris. Any Concerns about lawn fungus disease, water and grass at night. I often water my grass at night and have not had issues, but my neighbor mentions to me regularly that it's a bad practice. So uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, as far as irrigation goes, I think watering at night is the way to go. I think you're only gonna see issues with uh, increased disease pressure if the soil is already moist. Uh, if you're already having issues with uh, overwatering, if we've had a lot of rainfall, um, you know, say this last winter, we had plenty of rainfall and the soil just was not draining. Um, and then we have sort of a spike in temperature. We go from cool to warm or warm to cool, and that soil is staying moist. And moreover, those blades, the actual, the foliage is staying moist. That's where you run into problems. So I think the actual practice of, of watering at night is not a problem whatsoever. I think watering at night without consideration for atmospheric conditions, uh, you know, sort of ignoring what's going on otherwise, uh, can lead to issues down the line. Does that answer your question? Would you ever plant winter rye on a tall fescue lawn? Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Uh, Unless, you know, if you're not too concerned about the lack of uniformity, the only problem I foresee there is that, you know, the, the, the fescue could have undue competition from another cool season species because you don't have that nice sort of transition period between a warm season and a cool season. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily think it's recommended. Usually it's just meant to be a sort of band-aid for folks that, you know, desire that green lawn in the wintertime, but they have a warm season lawn planted. I think it would probably be more beneficial to try and supplement with some additional fescue uh, rather than putting rye in there. If it was like a pasture or if it was just an area that you were trying to put out to kind of cover crop, 
Um, you know, just have something to hold onto the soil. I don't think it would matter, but I would worry about it in kind of a lawn uh, context. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Well, okay, we've got, we still got some more time. If anybody has any other questions, uh, I'm happy to answer it. Other than that, I think I will one more time, I'm gonna put the, let's see, is it too late to plant fescue? It may be a little bit too late because I think we're generally looking at kind of end of the summer, beginning of fall. Let me pull that up and see exactly what we've got for that. So for our planting dates, which if you'll give me a second, I'm gonna put our survey, no problem at all. Happy to uh, provide the session for you all too. Pulling up our lawn calendar right now. Apologize, it's just taking its time. So for planting for our fescue, it looks like February uh, is kind of our, our best from a sodding perspective. For a new lawn, I, we've got marginal in April and May, but for if you're gonna seed fescue, uh, a partial or, or um, a best or another partial uh, would be in September, October, and November. So I will, Go ahead and toss that right in there. <coughs> so that is our, our fescue lawn calendar, if you want to look at that in terms of establishment. Okay, I've got you there. And so when do you recommend fertilizing new sod? I just put down some new sod a week ago. Fertilizer was placed in the soil before laying sod. Um, so I assume this is for a warm season variety. Chris, is this for uh, Bermuda or a zoysia? So zoysia, emerald, okay, yeah. So um, let's see, the, uh, let me just respond to this one real quick. The, the 10 steps, yeah, the lawn calendars can be found uh, at Georgia Turf, and you can also just search UGA lawn calendar and the variety of turf that you have, and you should be able to find that through Google. Um, for your uh, fertility question, I think you should probably be good if it was just laid. Uh, I would, if you're having issues with uh, greening or you're seeing chlorosis or if it's turning yellow or something like that, um, then I would consider doing a soil test and then maybe amending the fertility. Um, but at this point, you're probably fine if it was already given fertilizer out of the gate and you're not seeing any issues. So I would say you can probably fertilize, you know, again, maybe late summer, but probably would wait until next year. Any other questions? All right, well, if that's everything we've got, uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I will say again, thank you guys so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you could fill out that survey that I've posted, um, let's see, I'll make sure that's in there. Well, that's the uh, lawn calendar again. Let me just pull this up one more time. So the next session, I need to check mine. So the next session will be on June 17th. It'll be a Wednesday again. Uh, and we'll be discussing organic techniques. So that'll be Wednesday, June 17th. Um, that it will be uh, up. And at that point, we'll be back in the office, at least part-time. So I don't think we'll be running them in person just because we still are trying to keep it to fewer than 10 people for programming. Um, but it may be another Zoom session. We'll just run it just like this one. Uh, I just might actually be in my office instead of my bedroom that time. But otherwise, uh, thank you all so much. Please fill out that survey if you can. Um, we really appreciate it. And you all have a great day. And for those of you all that uh, have additional questions or have sent me some stuff, uh, I will be happy to send you the information. And with that, y'all have a great day.